Welcome, everybody, to the fourth and final session of Moth Identification Tips. Um, tonight's session could be a bit challenging, deliberately so. You've all learned a lot over the last three weeks, and it's time to you know, push the boundaries a bit. And it will not just be pushing the boundaries for recorders, but also for um, people like myself as County Moth recorders, because out there will be that's a little bit of challenge, I think, just to go, do we find some of the things that I'm going to be saying acceptable for recorders, providing they provide the evidence, or do we find that actually you're going, no, nah, not in my county? Because in the end of it, it is up to the county moth recorder what records do get accepted or not. So what you may hear from me may not be accepted in other counties. So just, just as a word of warning, you know, I do not hold sway over any, any anything other than perhaps what's going on in Dorset. Um, and even then, we're a collaborative uh, unit in Dorset, so we make pretty much joint decisions. Anyway, on to tonight. Um, Clume the Prominent. Um, ah, what a gorgeous moth. It's a, a rare prominent moth uh, found only in, wow, so the most long established woodlands uh, where there's field maple. And that can be scattered across um, southern England. But um, there aren't many places where this moth occurs in lots of places in a county. So, so um, there are one or two in Dorset scattered around the country uh, we find this moth. And it flies in uh, mid-November to early December. So it's a very late flyer and it would be easy to overlook it. And it's always worth trapping for in woodlands where there's long established field maple. And I think the point about the long established is that the female does fly. It comes to light late on in the night. Um, but it's, uh, as far as we know, she doesn't seem to fly very far from known haunts. So she's not a disperser. And so, uh, it's only in those woodlands where there's been a very, very long history of field maple being present that those, there's any real chance of that moth occurring. And as far as I'm aware, on the masses of field maple that's now planted in and around urban areas as a very good landscape tree, um, it is the, the moth simply hasn't spread onto it. So it does seem to be really pretty much confined to ancient woodlands. Anyway, there it is, a very beautiful late flying piece. But back to the here and now, um, we're going to start off with something relatively simple and then move into something more complex. Uh, so yellow underwings. I think we all feel we can probably do large and lesser yellow underwings. But I'm sure there will be some of you who've thought, can I easily identify a lunar yellow underwing? Should it ever come my way? What am I going to be looking for? What are those the features that I should use. Well, large yellow underwing and lesser yellow underwing are ubiquitous species, so they are pretty much common all over the country. Um, uh, barely, barely a place that won't occur. And if there aren't any dots near you, it's probably because people haven't been trapping enough. Lunar yellow underwing, on the other hand, is a highly restricted species in Britain. Most commonly, it's found in Breckland, so in Suffolk and Norfolk. Um, uh, but it's also, I don't know, it's, I think it's spreading a little bit within East Anglia. And I've certainly seen it um, in Essex around Malden. And I think it is just, it's doing better than it was in that part of the world. It's also present um, on the North Chalk Downs in North Hampshire and South Wiltshire, so Salisbury Plain, but it's pretty rare there, so very, very localized. Um, and then there's a there's this outlier up in Scotland, in Fife, right out on the coast north of St Andrews at Tensmuir. But nobody's seen it there since 2007. My guess is given the size of Tensmuir, it's an enormous dune system. It's probably still there and awaits rediscovery. But uh, it's, um, it's a species that's best looked for, actually, as a caterpillar, probably around Christmas time. But the adults do come to light. They come to light very well. 
And let me just tell you how we're going to distinguish them. I mean, I think you can already see from lesser and lunar yellow underwings, the lunar yellow underwing, the forewings are much brighter, much more strongly marked. And along the leading edge of the wing, you can see there are some so white coloration. So you get this sort of strong contrast between dark and light markings along the leading edge of the wing. But if you look at the top right example, you'll see that the resting position is particularly noticeable. And we were just, well, I was just talking about which wing over which wing, left over right, right over left. And you can see how neatly the lunar yellow underwing folds its wings over the body. And it's uh, so you end up with the moth where the leading edges of the wing on both sides are almost in parallel. Now compare that next door with the lesser yellow underwing, and that has a much broader wing. And at rest, the the uh, the the leading edges of the wings are rarely parallel, and the whole moth looks a chunkier, thicker set moth. And there are a couple of set examples here. Um, you can see. Uh, just how much the uh, lesser yellow underwing at the top is um, is a broader winged moth, and the lunar yellow underwing below narrow winged moth. Notice also the really characteristic twin black dots just in from the apex along the leading edge of the wing in the lunar yellow underwing, which are never present in lesser yellow underwing. So. They are relatively straightforward to identify. 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you live in East Anglia, you will be seeing lesser yellow underwing. It's a very common species. But on the other hand, don't ever think you will never see loony yellow underwing because it might just turn up. And what I've done on the right hand side is just to give you uh, this is the smallest example of large yellow underwing that I have found um, large yellow underwing is genuinely a large moth. And this very small example of large yellow underwing is just a bit bigger than lunar yellow underwing. But you can see just in from the apex, it still has those twin black dots. So it is possible to find large yellow underwing looking quite like lunar yellow underwing. But look at the wing shape, particularly the frailing edge of the wing and the outer edge of the wing, you can see that large yellow underwing has a point, more, much more of a pointed apex and a rather curved trailing edge to the wing. Um, so it's a rather rounded. And you look at how would you describe it as cut off, truncated, the forewing shape of the lunar yellow underwing is. So these three yellow underwings, all pretty easily separable, um, and the lunar yellow underwing by far the rarest, not everywhere, and particularly in East Anglia, um, it's, uh, I would say, a fairly regularly recorded species. Now, why is that? Why is it that uh, lunar, yellow, lunar yellow underwing is doing okay in East Anglia? I'm not really quite sure, but the caterpillars feed on fine grasses, so you need large expanses of fine grasses. And so perhaps that tells us why the moth is still on Salisbury Plain, where we've got this vast expanse of short grassland, um, where there's plenty of fescues out there. East Anglia, um, particularly in Breckland, there's big, big expanses of very fine grasses, which in very infertile land. And then even up in Tensmuir, you've got uh, uh, a very um, nutrient poor sand dune system with fine grasses and the moth may yet and probably still does occur in that area. So it's a species that likes unimproved grassland dominated by fine grasses. And um, let's hope that as nature recovery uh, gets, you know, gets going across England, the lunar yellow wandering will continue to recover. And, and it's the sort of species that could recover, which is why I say, just keep a note because it's a, it is a flyer. It does move around and, and it could turn up in any trap. Right. Now, I know over the last three lectures, I've been, well, some might say, banging on about how wonderful Scotland is. 
the top two examples are pretty standard examples of lesser yellow undoing that we'd find over most of England and probably Wales. And the middle three are examples of lesser yellow undoing from Scotland. Wow, they're just a, it's a, it's a very different looking moth. Yet again, another species with these wonderful, wonderful Scottish forms that just seem to pick out as being something completely different. Now, if you stick a pencil under, well, if you can, either either that or or um, you know, uh, knock it out with a bit of carbon dioxide and have a look at the hind wings. Some of the hind wings in Scottish examples are not really yellow, but they're suffused and all smoky. So uh, so that darkness on the forewing also is transmitted into the hind wing. So you sometimes find lesser yellow underwing in Scotland with very dark smoky hind wings as well. But just to say that in Southern England, we're not completely outdone by stunning forms of let's see yellow undoing. There's an example of a typical form from Scilly. So if anybody's out uh, in the summer on St. Mary's, St. Agnes or whatever, then the, 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 a regularly occurring form of let's see yellow undoing on, on Scilly looks like this. So it's a beautifully, wonderfully filigree, sort of beautifully outlined dark um, uh, lines either side of the uh, digmata. Wonderful stuff. Right, so that's the easy lot. Now we come on to something just that bit more tricky. And, well, depending on where you sit in Europe and depending on what your views are, these two species, lesser broad-border yellow wandering and Langmaid's yellow wandering, I think we think of them as separate species, but there are certainly experts in Europe who are really not quite so sure that these aren't all one and the same. There are certainly differences that seem to me to hold true by dissecting them and, and looking at the genitalia. Um, but and, and I think there are characters that we could use looking at the adults sitting in moth traps to help us distinguish them. And that's what I'm going to discuss now. The first thing to say, and let's just get my little wand. Uh, change the color. Here we go. Is the lesser yellow underwing and langmaids, they've got this greeny uh, front, visor to the front of the moth. So that's the first thing you look at if you think, oh, I'm not really quite sure which yellow underwing this is. Look to the front and it's got this wonderful sort of visor around the above the eyes and, and before it gets onto the main part of the thorax. So that sort of greenish color, um, rather nice. Um, then when you look at the forewings, um, the, the lesser broad bordered and langmaids are all a bit variable, to be honest. And it's hard to pick out Langmaid's yellow undoing among lesser broad borders until you have become a super expert in these sorts of things. For those who've run moth traps in France and Spain, you do get the hang of this when there are dozens of lesser broad borders and quite a lot of Langmaid's, is you can just turn over a box and there might be 20 of them in a on a box, egg box, and you can pick out the Langmaid's. They just seem to be blacker and more diffuse markings. And if you look at the left example, that's quite, it's got some quite strong angular markings and the right hand example is rather diffusely marked. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a much more subtle change in the, in the colors on the forewings. But let's see if we can kind of dig into that a little bit more. With some set examples, the main way to tell them apart is to look at the hind wings. Now in yellow underwings, and um, you, you can see here on the bottom left, well, that's a typical example. This, that's not my example, but a typical example of somebody who's picked up um, a yellow underwing in order to try and examine the hind wings to work out whether they've got a Langmaid's yellow underwing or not. And typically you end up with a thumbprint on the thorax, which rubs the scales off. And that's diagnostic of somebody who's done it. It's not a way that I would personally choose to do it because I think there is chance of damaging the individuals, but it's oft done. And which is why I do prefer if people do use carbon dioxide, because at least the moth is knocked out for 15 seconds and you can lift the hind wing easily without damaging the moth. 
and examine what's going on. And what we're after is to look at the extent of the black marking in the hind wing. Let's, so the Langmaid's yellow hind wing, so this bottom left example, basically the black marking extends from the inner part of the wing all the way around over the top of the yellow and back down into the broad band, hence the broad bordered yellow hind wing. Okay, if we go up to the top, Right, here's a lesser broad border yellow underwing, and it doesn't extend at all. Basically, you've got the dark on the inner margin and the and the and the dark band on the outer margin, and that's it. So there's no there's no black band of scales across the top, usually. So what I would say is that occasionally examples are there which are when dissected. Clearly, Langmaid's yellow underwings, but actually have got a yellow that extends all the way up to the leading edge of the hind wing. So, but if you do have an example, and below, and this in the other two half examples, you can see these black bands that extend um, around the leading edge of the hind wing, and those are quite clearly black all the way through. So, those bottom three, in my view, are clearly Langmaid's yellow underwings. Now, one other thing to say about this is the three examples in the bottom row, the four wings all look quite strongly marked with quite strong contrasting marks in them, um, in dots and dashes, and they look very, very like the four wings of lesser broad border yellow one wing. And that's because these individuals have been found in the autumn. So these are September examples. And in my experience, um, and in Southern England, we're getting more and more experience of Langmaid's yellow underwings. Quite often, the ones that appear in moth traps in the autumn are, are very, very similar to lesser broad border yellow underwing. Is there anything in the four wing character that can help you separate out lesser broad border from Langmaid's? The, the only one character that I think just at least makes me Take an example to look at later is this inner, the, 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 the shape and uh, wiggliness of this inner line, this sort of um, uh, line here, this dark line, which in lesser broad bordered yellow underwing has kind of loops in it and, and is a bit wiggly, when often in the Langmaid's yellow underwing is relatively straight. Now, that is not a diagnostic feature. But it's certainly a, a, a character that will help you try and find, in amongst all the others, the Langmaid's yellow underwings. The other thing to say is lesser broad border yellow underwing is really quite rare in the autumn. And so if you do find um, uh, any of these broad bordered yellow underwings turning up in the autumn, then they have a fair chance they could be Langmaid's yellow underwing. But you can see all these three as much as you can tell. I mean, this here, this line on the right-hand example, pretty faint. And if you look at the lesser broad border above it, you can't see a line at all. So it's not a diagnostic feature. Please don't use it as that, but it just helps you pick out the examples that might be worth further examination. And then that further examination is clearly got to be looking at how much yellow there is in the hind wing. But not only that, Let's just erase that mark. We can also look at the underside of the forewing. And that does show, not always, but in most cases, uh, a, a key feature of, of difference. If you look at the underside of the forewing, you can see um, a black area smudged across most of the wing. The, the trailing edge of that black area it's it, the, the the difference is in how it blends into the pale brown beyond. If you take the top and middle phalanx of your hand right now, stretched out, and fold the top and middle phalanx down towards your palm, you will see that your lower phalanx comes out with a slightly loop, loopy edge to it. And that's the kind of loopy edge that you see here in lesser broad border. Oh, hang on. There's a, a sort of 
slightly curly. Uh, so they've got indentations, um, not necessarily very clear. And in worn examples, these are not clear at all. But you can see there's a bit of a sort of upsy downsiness here, where in Langmaid's yellow undering, it's almost always a smooth cutoff or a, or a blurring of it, and you just don't see those wiggles. So that is another feature. But I defy anybody to do that easily without damaging the individual, unless you're using carbon dioxide in order to, to um, help. Right. So back now, because we've only talked about autumn individuals now, back now, who are summer individuals. So these are the ones that will, will you know, probably be slightly easier to find in your moth trap to separate out into broad border langmaids. So langmaids yellow underwing tends to be, if it's around, it's the first of the of this group to turn up in your moth trap. Hence John Langmaid, when he first found this in South Sea in Hampshire, it was a it was an example that had turned up towards the end of June, and he thought, I don't normally see lesser broad borders until July, second week of July, maybe first week of July. I think I'll hang on to that one and show it to Barry Gota. And Barry Gota said, that is a new species to Britain. So the time of year is important, but do remember, of course, that time of year is shifting forward for many moths anyway. So it, 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 it wouldn't be too surprising these days to find a lesser broad border yellow undoing in the last week of June, just as much as a Langmaid's yellow undoing. So it's not it's not all or nothing, but if you're very if you look at your very first of this group, they may well be uh, Langmaid's yellow undoings. But there is another feature that I think I quite like um, as helping me pick out the individuals uh, from among the lesser broad borders. And if you look at the outer line of the lesser broad border yellow undoing, well, it's got a nice little zigzag and the outer line of the Langmaid's nice little zigzag. But what's going on beyond that outer line in the lesser broad border yellow undoing, you've got usually half a dozen or five, six little black dashes. And in the summer generation of Langmaid's yellow underwing, they are sometimes present, but often not. Or if they are present, it's one or two of them. There are, of course, quite a number of individuals of Langmaid's that have got them, four or five. But it just seems that the number is often less in Langmaid's yellow underwing than in the surfboard or the yellow underwing. And I think that helps to explain why the four wings of that summon generation you flip to the bottom right, I think that helps to explain why the forewing is so often looking more diffuse. It's just not as well defined because those little black flecks can just about make out a little black fleck there and maybe one there, but it's pretty minuscule. Whereas in top left, you can see the very, very clear black dashes on the lesser broad border yellow one doing. So those are my kind of top tips, if you like, for helping to try and separate out in amongst all of the lesser broad borders, the most likely candidates for um, Langmaid's yellow undoing. But it, it, the very best thing to do is to get that combination of characters. If you've got the forewing without many dots, you've got the hindwing with, with a complete black margin, particularly along that leading edge of the hindwing, and the underside of the forewing with uh, um, none of those sort of little loops, little, uh, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a smoother finish, a smoother transition between the black and the pale brown, then that's going to be a Langmaid's yellow undoing on the superficial characters. Um, if, if any one of those characters is missing, you know, there's a little bit more doubt as to which species it is. But um, those, that, that, set of characters, three characters there should really help separate these two models. Oh, you know, now we are going on to, because we can't just talk about underwings without doing this lovely group. Not suggesting there's any particular problem in identifying most of these based on the color of the hindwings, 
Um, but just to just to share some wonderful pictures of this stunning group of dark crimson, light crimson, red, oak yellow, blue underwing, and a rosy underwing. And um, top right is red underwing. That is probably going to be the uh, most widespread species, but I can't remember now whether it occurs in Scotland. So we're just about to use my trip sheet to find out. It just about gets into Scotland, into Dumfries and Galloway. So, but it might spread, but it's pretty widespread. It's less of a westerly species, um, but does occur in Devon, Cornwall and Wales. Um, but it's pretty much um, ubiquitous over most of England um, uh, and it's on willows and uh, um, and poplars and it's it's around. And its characteristic is it's got a nice black, round central dot but otherwise it's a fairly fuzzy gray and it's the sort of species that you might just catch a glimpse of it sitting on a wall and as soon as you walk up to it the moth flies away it's very that's one of the characteristics of red underwing is you just see that flash of red and black and white as it disappears let's pop to the bottom left to oak yellow underwing here's a Diminutive species, this is probably not much bigger than a copper underwing, a little bit bigger, a little bit broader in the wing. But it just seems to be turning up in small numbers in London. And there are other records. There's even one record from Wales. Um, it seems to be a species that's uh, doing quite well in Europe. And I think there's every opportunity for this species to get properly established in Britain. It may already be established in London. Um, but worth keeping an eye you're very, very unlikely to overlook it. Um, one of the characteristics that it has, let me just get my pointer onto it. Uh, hang on. Uh, there we go. Is the outer, the line beyond the, the, the central, here's a central dot. So the, the outer line beyond that is well-defined and very jagged. Okay, and obviously the moth has yellow hind wings, but if it's sitting with its wings tight closed, and you think you might have an oak yellow hind wing, I defy anybody to stick a pencil in to have a look without having to put it in a pot, because it's almost certain to buzz off before you've had a chance to photograph it. So oak yellow hind wing, it's a species to be aware of, is that it's not just something in Southern Europe, it appears to be turning around here. Next door. Clifton nonpareil or blue in the wing. Now, there's a species that was extremely rare um, in Britain, confined really to central Kent into the Weald, where it was breeding in um, Alston Forest until about the 62 63 winter, which appears to have been the time at which it died out as a resident species in Britain. But it's come back in the last 15 years or so. And have come back in numbers and have spread very, very fast. Um, uh, the individuals have probably arrived from Southern Europe as much as they've arrived from Northern Europe. Uh, so this species is now abundant in Finland and it's very, very widespread across Eastern Europe and the numbers are probably set to increase in, in Britain. So if you haven't yet had the wonderful opportunity to see one of these in your moth trap, my guess is it will be coming to a trap near you very soon. And, and that could that could be anywhere, absolutely anywhere. There's no reason why it shouldn't become, I guess, relatively widespread in Scotland, dare I say it. There aren't very many records, um, but it is a species that's spreading fast. To the right of that is rosy underwing. And here's another species that seems to be doing well in Europe and is spreading north. And it's almost certain. I mean, it has to be now resident in Dorset, and it's certainly resident on the Channel Islands, particularly in Jersey, but I think now that there are, uh, it's regularly seen in Guernsey. Um, but the numbers that have been turning up actually at Butterfly Conservation's headquarters have been far too many, far too frequently over the last 10 years that this moth has to be resident in Purbeck, in, in the uh, in the Froome and the Piddle Valleys. The caterpillars are almost certainly eating grey willow and the moth turns up in the 
end of August, first week of September, pretty regularly on the in in the in the track that's run at the butterfly conservation headquarters. So it's a slightly smaller species than red underwing, and rather like oak oh, yellow underwing, it's got these jagged lines across the wings. Um, on this one, on a very a relatively pale grey background, striking and characteristic. And then when you do see the hind wings, they are rosy pink, beautiful. Then to the top left and the centre, and the centre one in the top row. So dark crimson underwing, light crimson underwing. Both these species are expanding their range and relatively rapidly. Dark crimson underwing is seems to be a very good long distance traveler and individuals turn up on the coast. I think they've even they said one's turned up in Shetland, I believe. Certainly a very, very long way north. Um, so these these things will travel and it seems to me that they are establishing uh, much more widely than they were. And light crimson underwing again, Yes, that was these two species were pretty much residents of the new forest and central England ancient woodlands, uh, with light crimson underwing very slightly more widespread than dark crimson. But now I think both of these are set to spread fairly rapidly throughout um, throughout southern England. So we could expect to see them turning up in moth traps almost anywhere. Now you wouldn't be, you know, from you look at those, they are very similar indeed. Light crimson underwing is a shade smaller than dark crimson underwing. And if you look at the four wings, you can see that uh, light crimson underwing in most examples is more contrasting in the markings. So it's definitely got quite a lot of pale on it and definitely quite a lot of dark. Compare that with dark crimson underwing. And the most notable feature is, um, is, a, is a central dot that's surrounded by pale color. And the only pale is around that dot. Um, but there is one feature that I would just like to point out to you, I think really is diagnostic for these species. Um, so it's ju just about the colors. And let's get my wand. If you look at the, so towards the base from this central dot, so here's the central dot in a dark crimson underwing, you've got a dark line. So the inner, uh, the inner margin of this paler area, and this inner margin has got a, a black line that runs down the wing in a zigzag fashion, but always touches this lower white dot. So I'm just putting an arrow there. Maybe that's not very clear. But if you look on the light crimson underwing, follow down that line. No, look, there's a gap there between the direction of the line and the pale dot. Okay, so let me just remove those things and I might just use my pointer. See if that helps. So the pointer here, you can see here's a pale dot in the wing that I'm highlighting in dark crimson underwing. Here's the equivalent in light crimson underwing. And you follow down the this this uh, dark line on the inner margin of the pale area, and that dark line doesn't join the pale dot in light crimson underwing, but in the dark crimson underwing, it does. Boom. Certainly true of all the examples I've ever looked at. There has to be a however, because nothing is ever certain in the world of natural history. There are very occasionally light crimson underwings that have all black four wings. Good luck trying to identify them. You will then have to look at the shape of the black line in the hind wing, which I haven't got to show you here, but is a rather straighter line than in dark crimson underwing. But I think for most examples, this is a perfectly good way of telling them apart. Okay, so there are some beautiful moths. Um, wonderful to be able to see those. There aren't many people in Britain who've seen all six species, or indeed have seen all six in their garden, but there are one or two. and. Um, Congratulations to them. I hope we will all have the chance. Right. By popular demand, we are now moving on to rustic and uncertain and all that lot. Because they are quite often confused. They're quite common. And people want to record them. And most county recorders, including myself, go, please 
have these as aggregates. They are really, really hard to tell apart unless you're going to dissect them. And then I've gone, yeah, but I really want to be able to help get us to the point where at least we can, you know, with certainty in our gardens or wherever we are, say, yes, I've definitely recorded uncertain. And yes, I've definitely recorded rustic. Even if, I don't know, half of them are still impossible to do, you can pick out using combinations of characters, individuals which you are certain are uncertain and are certain are rustic. But just before we do in that, I just want to go through the bottom four species. So that's Clancy's vines, mottled rustic and pale mottled willow. Now, we'll start with mottled rustic. Um, let's just get my ribbon rustics up. Um, mottled rustic is, um, is a common species until you get to Scotland. And then it's just a bit more local and it's certainly not a species up in the highlands. So um, if I refer to it as common, it's because it's common in England and Wales in particular, it's certainly present in Northern Ireland too. Um, and it's genuinely mottled. Most of the markings in the mottled rustic are rather fuzzy. They're not well-defined. And if you compare with rustic, uncertain, Clancy's rustic and vines rustic, you can see how mottled rustic has those, particularly the um, the, uh, uh, the the few stigmata in the middle of the wing, um, the kidney shape. Um, it, it's hard to work out that it's a kidney shape. You can just about see, looking at my highlighter, that the that it's a kidney shape in that individual, but it's not very clear. So it's um, a suffused looking uh, ray brown moth, more gray than brown, I would say, and otherwise undistinguished, bless it. Uh, it's mottled rustic. Next door on the left is vines rustic. Now I showed you vines rustic um, uh, back here when we were identifying um, common Quaker. And uh, the reason for that was because uh, some people when it gets into June, forget that common Quakers are dying out and the vines rustics are coming in and will continue to record um, uh, common Quaker when they probably should be recording vines rustic. Vines rustic is a mid gray moth. And if you have any difficulties, the, the of all of these rustics, the um, kidney shape and the, the oval are large and they are almost always nicely outlined whitish. Um, so the, um, so they are, that those, those should, that really should help um, separate that species at first glance, mid gray with these large stigmata in the middle of the wing. Many individuals, but not all, also have a very pale um, leading edge to the wing. Can you see? Yeah, that it's almost whitish. I'm just drawing my highlighter below to highlight the whitish above. But there are plenty of individuals that are all gray to the edge of the wing. So it's not a diagnostic feature, but if it has got that really pale leading edge, then it's almost certain to be vines rustic. Let's move to the left and then Clancy's rustic. Now, Clancy's rustic is uh, a species that was, when did it? turned up in just after the millennium 2002, I believe. Sean Clancy found it in Kent. And um, it's a species that is a very pale gray, a beautiful, lovely love gray, would you call it, with the either brownish or blackish um, stigmata. And the uh, uh, kidney-shaped stigmata is, is big, and the oval is a tiny dot usually, but it also has a number of black marks along the leading edge of the wing. So if you've got a pale gray moth and it's got these very dark stigmata in the wing and dots along the edge of the wing, then that will be Lancy's rustic. Um, Lancy's rustic, from time to time, I'm pretty certain it's breeding around me in Weymouth and I see it pretty regularly in two generations a year probably more examples in the autumn in September than, than I would do in June, but I, I see them at both times a year. But last autumn, Pansy's rustic was certainly turning up a lot further inland. And um, 
uh, I think I think Clancy's rustic will probably, like Vine's rustic, which used to be in the 1970s, was a species that started to spread very rapidly, having only been an immigrant species before before then in the 1960s. I think Clancy's rustic is following about half a century later and will probably spread and establish quite widely in England and who knows how far north it will get. Flip over to the right-hand side to pale mottled willow. And I've already dis, um, just given you um, uh, the, the on the Clancy's rustic, the leading edge of the wing has dark dots on it. The same is also true for pale mottled willow. So there's a dot there and one there and one there and some more and even the odd little tiny dot there. So these dark dots along the leading edge of the wing, plus look at the way the moth is sitting. It sits with its wings really tightly held over the over the abdomen, one right the way over the other. So this looks a very narrow moth when it's at rest. OK, so those four should all be pretty straightforward to identify, I hope. And then we will now go to the ones that aren't. Well, hey. Lots of set examples for you to look at, because here are the characteristics that I think and sort of the challenges out there to say, can we put together a group of characters that at least help us identify with certainty and uncertain and with certainty a rustic, even if some individuals remain all but impossible to do? The first thing to say is there's variation between sexes as well as the species. And as you can see from the individuals at the bottom, I don't have many examples of female rustic and female uncertain to be certain about the characters I'm going to give you. But I think there are pointers. I would hope by the end of this summer, um, I will have the evidence. And what I'm proposing is at least to put some of these examples, these pictures onto the Dorset Moth Group website with some a little bit of an identification pack, if you like, just some notes that, that then will help you identify these species. It's a different matter whether your county recorder will accept those as valid or not. And that's not up to me. But uh, I think we're going to give it a go in Dorset and see how far we get. But let's see. So the first thing is to look at the four wings. And on the uncertain, I would describe the uncertain forewing in the male as gingery brown, slightly orange brown, pale orange brown, perhaps. And in the rustic, it's usually more of a gray brown. OK, so that's the first set, first two characters to look for. The next is the central fuzzy band that runs through the kidney shaped stigma. So here we go in uncertain up here. OK, and well, not very well down here, but there you go. That's that one. And you go, if it is orange brown in the, in the four wings and it's got this central a fuzzy band, then that's a pretty good start for being uncertain. However, hop over to the rustic and you can see here, well, there is a sort of band here. And actually there is a band in the bottom left female. So it's not an all or nothing character, that band. Um, but if you add the presence of the band to the orange brown forewing, then that's a good start for separating out rustic from uncertain. Next thing is look at the hind wing color in the males. The hind wing color of rustic is usually pale. It's almost got a bit of a shine to it, a sort of creamy, shiny white to it, where in uncertain on the right hand side, it's just a bit sort of more pale orangey brown. There is a, there is a subtle difference there. So we've got potentially three characters emerging that help us shift an example either to uncertain or to rustic. The next thing to do is to look at the underside of the forewing. The underside of the forewing in uncertain, not all individuals, but almost all individuals have got uh, the um, kidney-shaped stigma going through strongly. And it's quite big. 
that's uh, quite well defined. Okay, perhaps not always, but almost always. And then flip over to look at the underside of the fore wing in rustic. And in many individuals, it's barely noticeable at all. Or if it is, there's a little bit of a comma shape, perhaps, maybe a dot. But it's certainly not a. It's certainly not um, uh, what you could define as a as a kidney shape. And I think that adds a fourth character to be able to help separate male uncertain from male rustic. So I think if you have all all four combination, a combination of all four characters, that is injury brown forewing, a reasonably strong fuzzy band on the forewing leading through the uh, kidney shaped stigma. You've got the hind wing that certainly isn't creamy white. And you've got the underside of the forewing marking with a strong kidney shaped mark, and that will be uncertain. Okay, so I think that combination of characters should do to help us separate out males. Okay, and remember the male can be separated from the female because the male has a relatively straight abdomen that slightly splays at the end. You can see the scales that splay out slightly, whereas the female, relatively straight abdomen, but it comes down to a point. Now, the females, as I say, I don't have enough individuals here, but the female of rustic is usually quite a dark individual, and the female of uncertain is pretty much like the male. Turn, turn over to look at the underside of the forewing, and the markings on the underside of the forewing of female uncertain are nowhere near as strong as the males but they are present and for all the examples that i've looked at of female rustic there is hardly ever any marking on the underside of the forewing at all whatsoever it's, it, there is barely a dot that you can discern and actually the center part of the underside of the forewing of rustic tends to be a rather mid-gray uh, so it's certainly not got that sort of pale scaling running through it that there is in the underside of the forewing of female uncertain. So there you go. I think in due course, it may be possible to separate the species on superficial characters without having to lump them all as aggregates or indeed resort to killing them and dissecting them. Now, I say maybe, um, I think jury out and I would ask people to do their best to photograph these and to think about them. Maybe this works extremely well in Dorset, but doesn't work elsewhere. We don't know. But this is this is the point about having mass numbers of people out looking at these common species, which are so often aggregated, when actually we might really be able to separate them, not with any ease, but at least with some confidence to be able to get them recorded. So, Good luck with that. Um, I will certainly be posting something on the Dorset Moth Group website before these things start emerging in mm, June and uh, so that people can look that up and, and um, we can have a go. Right, here's another species pair that I think we ought to be separating and that is the, um, the Cleris. So these, these are Cleris. Uh, so that's the um, dark marked tortrix, Eclaris lateriana, and the strawberry tortrix, Eclaris camariana. So lateriana on the right, camariana on the left. Um, these individuals, the reason for the difficulty is there's an overlap in the autumn where the dark marked tortrix flies from July all the way into September, even individuals into October. Whereas the strawberry tortrix tends to be a sort of June moth, May to very early July as an adult. And then it reappears as a second generation in August and September. So there's clearly a period of complete overlap uh, in the latter half, latter part of the summer. So if you find an individual that looks like one of these two species in June, it's it's almost certain to be strawberry tortrix, Eclaris camariana. Um, 
On the other hand, and I've encouraged it in Dorset, is people just lump these species together and oh, it just feels a bit of a cop out and we ought to do something more about it. So in the latest edition of the Micromar Field Guide, we've set about trying to separate them and here's how it goes. So the first thing is the size difference in the forewing length. Now you remember forewing length is the length of the forewing from the base of the wing out to the apex. Okay, base of the wing to the apex. And it's pretty obvious from these uh, pairs of individuals that I've selected for tonight is that there is a size difference. The um, dark mark cortex is really somewhat again bigger than the strawberry cortex. However, there is clearly overlap. So there will be larger ones of ones and certainly smaller ones of dark mark cortex. But, but overall, now if you look at the wing shape carefully, I think you can also see that in um, the dark mark portraits, the apex is very slightly falcate. It's almost got a hook on it. It's not quite a hook tip type hook, but it's certainly that uh, trailing edge of the wing is, is a bit of a scoop as it comes out to the apex and the and the the tip of the the, the leading edge comes down to meet a, I don't know, it just almost looks slightly pointed, where in the strawberry tortrix, I reckon you could define that as being quite rounded. It's got a slight point, but it's certainly not falcate. So I think that is a key feature that separates them. Has it got a falcate wingtip or not? Is it a, you know, measure the forewing? Is it a larger example or a smaller example? There is a further feature that we've now illustrated in the field guide, and that's to do with the length of the palp. The palp, so the two little pointy bits uh, between the antennae and forward of the eyes. And there are three segments, but by and large, you can only see two segments. And here are these um, photographs really blown up. I don't have decent examples of strawberry torches at the minute to be able to show you. But do you see how much shorter the palps are on on strawberry tortrix than dark marked tortrix. And it's particularly the second segment, as they call it, this second segment in the dark marked tortrix is much longer than in the strawberry tortrix. And here are some set examples where you've got a long um, second segment of the, of the uh, um, belt, and in here it's a rather shorter one. Now, does this is this infallible? I don't know, but certainly from all the individuals that I've ever examined, this sort of combination of features is, I think, sufficient to be able to separate strawberry tortrix from dark mark tortrix. Again, will your county recorder accept that? That's up to him or her to do that. Um, but from my point of view, if, if somebody is going to provide me with the evidence, which is close-up photograph, and um, and and something of a wing measurement because it's obviously difficult to look at relative size from one photograph. Then I think I'm going to find that acceptable evidence of one species or the other without having to aggregate the records. Okay, let's just close. Right, next we're going to spend a few minutes just whizzing through some caterpillars because. We're coming up to a very good caterpillar time of year. And I always think it's fun to be able to show people uh, that it's not all about moth trapping. The first thing to say is top left, garden tiger moth. Garden tiger moth is one of those species that's declined massively in the central part of its range in England. To the point that there are some people in central England who now never, ever see a garden tiger. And yet this was the woolly bear of our childhood days when we see them racing around across roads and most of it in in uh, in central England. This species is still relatively common on the coast and it's um it's certainly doing okay uh, the sort of further north you get uh, but it tends to be coastal and it can be spectacularly abundant really really common in um, on the Cornish coast and you get these wonderful forms that 
don't just have lots of spots on them, but you get the, the forms without any spots in, in those areas where the moth is common and, and on the Cornish coast, that's true. It's the long, it's the biggest, hairiest uh, caterpillar that we have in, in Britain. So these extremely long hairs, and you can see there's a bit of gingery brown to some of those hairs. But you've got a dark, a sort of dark brown, blackish body with these white knots on it. And that's very characteristic of garden tiger. And those caterpillars are going to be out whizzing around what they're feeding now. And they will be fully fed by some point in May. Next door on the top row is cream spot tiger. Cream spot tiger, not dissimilar, but it's it's got short tufts of hairs. Um, but otherwise is a dark you know, velvety black caterpillar. But the characteristic you need to look for for cream spot tiger, and cream spot tiger has got um, um, I mean, a reasonable distribution in Britain. It tends to be rather coastal. Um, it, it In southern Britain, from about Norfolk all the way around to uh, Cornwall, and it just gets into su southern Wales. But it does get inland. I know it's regularly found in Shaftesbury in North Dorset. Um, uh, and so it's clearly breeding there, but it is normally a coastal species. But it's the sort of species that um, at Easter time, if the sun does come out, um, uh, you'll see this caterpillar uh, sunning itself on the coastal path. And how do you tell that it's definitely green spot tiger? Because you need to look for the red head and red legs. Can you see that the uh, the head here is 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 red and these red or uh, uh, thoracic legs. Okay, so uh, that's it. with the other leg we can't see, but uh, that that's how you distinguish the green spot tiger caterpillar. Also around in the spring, bottom left is wood tiger, and wood tiger is quite a variable caterpillar, but it's always bicolored. Depends on which bits bicolored and which which bits are brown and which bits are black, but it's but it's always got brown tufts on it at one end and black tufts on it at the, at the other. But sometimes it is a bit variable as to how much. It's um it's a it's a widespread species wood tiger in in Britain. It's certainly not a species that you find in eastern England or southeast England. So it it uh, comes down the sort of western half of. Uh, of England and Wales, heading down into Dorset, where it can be spectacularly abundant on on some of the downlands uh, north of Dorchester. And then it goes all the way up into northern England and out into Scotland and across Northern Ireland. And it's a widespread species there of moorland um, and, and very beautiful too. Now, move to the right and we have a ruby tiger. Now, ruby tiger the caterpillar ruby tiger occurs in various colour forms. In lowland Britain, it tends to be this one in the centre. So it's a fairly orangey brown um, with uh, these hairs. And if you look at the uh, hairs at the front, the hairs at the front tend to point upwards, slightly reclining. Then towards the back of the caterpillar, they're swept back. OK, so the hairs are swept back and that is Really characteristic of ruby tiger. Seem to have made some sort of a plunk out of that one, but there we go. Um, it's just erase my artwork. Um, but look to the right, and you can see the dark form of it. And guess where this dark form occurs? Scotland. This is form borealis of the um, uh, uh, ruby tiger. And the caterpillars occur in three color forms in Scotland, probably integrates between them, but it has the standard color that we get all over Britain, this sort of orangey brown, this dark brown that we've got on the right, and it's also got a jet black form, form borealis. And you can understand something to do with why that might be the case, to do with sunshine and insulation. Is, and, and there must be some sort of a trade-off between the color of the caterpillar and the uh, and, and the amount of sun. So the warmer it gets, it sits in the sunshine, the faster it can move but that may make it more visible. So there may be some trade-off, which is why the polymorphism occurs. And just so, uh, just so you're not too disappointed, in Scotland, form borealis occurs as a normal red forewing, but it also occurs in this smoky dark form here. So uh, again, here's ruby tiger. Once you get into Scotland, looking at this stunning variation 
on something which over most of uh, most of the rest of Britain is a pretty standard, very lovely moth. Right, just a quickie on a couple more tigers, Jersey tiger and scarlet tiger. Um, scarlet tiger used to be quite a rare species, but it's um, undergone a massive increase in England over the last 50 years or so and is becoming really much a very much of an urban moth where the caterpillars they feed on all sorts of of um of plants particularly nettles but they also love alkanet so that's the uh, little plant with broad broad bright green leaves with tiny blue flowers alkanet i mean you know most of the towns in in central england will have alkanet growing in car park edges and road verges and they will almost certainly these days have scarlet tiger caterpillars on them in the spring. Unmistakable, but well worth looking out for. Top left is Jersey tiger. Jersey tiger is spreading very rapidly from a species that was pretty much confined to Channel Islands and the southwest of Britain, now really abundant in London, certainly spread over most of southern Britain and heading north. So if you haven't yet got Jersey tiger with you in central England, it probably won't be long. The adults are much easier to record than the caterpillars, but if you are out weeding the garden and you see some amazing gingery caterpillar with this yellow stripe down the back, then that will be Jersey tiger. Look immediately to the right though, and um, that caterpillar, photograph of that caterpillar was sent to me saying, what's that, Phil? I think it's a footman moth. And I was quite convinced it was a footman moth too. But it wasn't. It's a young, early instar version of Jersey Tiger. And thanks to Barry Henwood for putting me right on that one. So look how that caterpillar changes as it grows from a dark caterpillar with a red stripe down the back through to something pretty gorgeous on the left hand side. And I've just included a couple of footmen larvae because both these footmen are now very common species in Britain. And increasingly, you will see common and scarce footman lava sitting on algae covered fences or, or lichen covered trees, sitting out in the sunshine in the early spring. And it's always just nice to be able to identify them. Common footman is a black caterpillar with the lateral, with, with the uh, sort of spiracular stripe rather, is an orange brown. So it's got this orange brown stripe. And in scarce footman, it's got two rows of dots. So we call them a sub dorsal line. So just down from the back, it's got these uh, rows of orange spots. Okay. Now, I think time wise, how are we doing? Okay, just just keep going for a little bit longer. Yep. Um, just a couple more slides now to finish off with. Um, the nest building caterpillars, we're coming up to a time of year when all the spring bushes are out, and we start seeing depending on where we are, um, uh, the nest building um, caterpillars. And it's just nice if we can have a reasonable chance of identifying which they are. The brown tail moth is the one species that forms its nest in the autumn. And the picture I'm showing you in the top left is the very characteristic, not only the nest, but the feeding pattern. You can see that the slow bush has got browned leaves near the nest. And that's because the caterpillars have been feeding gregariously on the upper surface of the leaf only. And that's what the brown tail caterpillar does in the autumn. So if you see white nests with this browning of the bush around the nest, then that will undoubtedly be brown tail. Come the springtime, the caterpillars grow rapidly. And the one key feature beyond anything else to be able to tell brown tail caterpillar from everything else is the two orange warts that there are down towards the back end of the caterpillar. Two bright orange warts that stick out. Okay, into the middle and we have lackey caterpillar. Now lackey is a species that's um, declined massively. So it's found um, coastal in Wales. Uh, it's in uh, the, the uh, Republic of Ireland. Um, and it's throughout England, but it's uh, it's slightly less common in the West than the East, but it certainly gets up as, as far as Yorkshire. And these have bright white nests and uh, wonderful masses of stripy caterpillars that are on them. And 
in their last instar, that bottom picture shows a last instar, lackey caterpillar. At that stage, the caterpillars go on a walkabout. So they abandon the nest and you can see these caterpillars on bramble bushes, hawthorns, slow rows, uh, a range of species where the caterpillars are on dispersal. And what's unusual about that is you can see blue on the, on the flank of the caterpillar. And blue, if you think about it, is a very unusual cat uh, color to see on a caterpillar and indeed an adult moth. There are, there are plenty of blue butterflies, but in moths, it's very unusual. And that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a Tyndall effect. It's not a real blue color. It's caused by the, the, uh, the scattering of light as it hits the microstructures on the side of the caterpillar, that effectively it's the same process as makes the sky blue. So it's a scattering of the light, and we're seeing the reflected blue light back. On the far right-hand side, it's small egger. Now, small egger, when I was growing up, was an extremely rare moth indeed, and it is expanding and expanding fairly rapidly these days. They form big white nests, and while the caterpillars are sitting on the nests, they're not quite jet black, but pretty much black, and they can see down the flanks of them, you can see these little white dots. So that's very characteristic of, um, of, of small egger. And the best thing to do is to be driving down the road, stop at a lay-by somewhere, get out your binoculars and scan the hedgerows. And you can e you pretty easily spot in amongst the green leaves, these bright white nests. So uh, small egger is now, um, it's, a, it's, it's common in the Southwest of Britain, but it's scattered through central Britain, and it is in Norfolk, uh, this one into Yorkshire. It's in uh, um, Welsh marches. Or is that Cropshire? I think it's more Cropshire. Um, and it's certainly up in uh, North Lancashire. Um, so it's a species that's that could easily turn up anywhere and start spreading. And it's pretty widespread in uh, in Ireland, both in Northern Ireland and in um, and in mainland um, in the, the rest of the republic of ireland so lovely moth and you can see the caterpillar in its last instar it too goes on dispersal and it's got this wonderful uh dark velvety uh, look to the caterpillar with uh, with these long hairs and yellow sort of l u and l shapes down the down the flanks just on back to brown tail and we can see the um hairs on the brown tail, if you get under an electron microscope, that's what you see on those horrible hairs that cause the skin rash. And you can sort of start to understand why. So that is a hypodermic needle. So it's hollowed out in the center and full of chemicals that dissolve the skin and cause a, a, a rash. But you can see that it's uh, particularly down towards the, the, the bottom end of that, quid pointing barbs. So if you scratch, when all you're doing is pushing the hair ever further into your skin and more and more of the chemical gets released from the hypodermic that's in there. So it's a, it's an evil sod. And there's probably about half a million of those hairs on any one caterpillar. And, and because they're so microscopic, half a, they're about oh, 50 microns long. It's that half a millimeter long, these hairs. And so they blow around in the wind. You know, it's not that it's not the main hairs that you see on the caterpillar that are causing the problem. It's these microscopic hairs. Right, final slide, just ground lackey, because ground lackey is a species that's very rare in Britain. It does look quite similar to lackey, but it's a salt marsh species. And uh, it's uh, North Kent, Essex, and just into Suffolk um, on the on the on the coast, where it's in those wonderful extensive salt marshes. And it tends to be on the upper salt marsh near the uh, near the sort of sea defences often, uh, where it's just very slightly drier. And if you're out for a walk in the springtime, you may see these clusters of of uh, brownish caterpillars over the uh, a whole range of salt marsh plants, not not just um, uh, sea plantain and sea arrow grass. They're on a range of them. Um, uh, there is also a wee colony at Axmouth, Axmouth in Devon, uh, where just up just up from the um, uh, up river about half a mile, um, there is a, there, there's been a colony for very very many years, and it it's it's a very small colony, um, but it's uh, but it's been pretty much static there in Devon for a very long time. So a really really super moth to 
Like, it's worth a pilgrimage, to be honest, to go and have a look at ground lackey caterpillars. Okay, I think that is the lot. But thank you very much indeed. I hope that's been uh, a good end to our sessions and uh, you've uh, learned something, enjoyed seeing some wonderful pictures.